And welcome to this episode of the I Hate Matt Ball Poetry Podcast, where today I'm going to finish answering Ethan's question from like four fucking episodes ago. I'm going to respond to some more comments and um, just kind of give you a few little updates and what have you on what's going on in my life. Okay, so in case you didn't know, I've been sick for um, about a week now. No, not quite. Not quite at all. Like, maybe four or five days. It doesn't seem to be getting better. I have a doctor's appointment in just a little bit. And some of you might be going, if you're watching the video, Matt, why are you smoking if you're sick? Um, Because I'm fucking addicted. And that's what fucking addicts do. Jesus fucking Christ. If I could just quit smoking because I have a fucking cold, I wouldn't be smoking at all. Fuck. Am I right? Updates. I only have one more abnormal brain, okay? So if you guys want it, get it now because they're gone, okay? When they're gone. Cyber Monday, I guess is what it is. I was going to do some Black Friday shit, and then I'm like, you know what? I'll just wait till Monday. There's going to be enough people doing shit. But my new chapbook called Fuck You is going to be out. And that book is a book full of poems that are very angsty. Um, And they're angsty about love. They're angsty about poetry. They're angsty about society. Okay. So if you dig that kind of shit, you'd like that book. But the difference with this one is that on December 2nd, I am actually going to have what the people in Australia call a launch party for my book, okay? Basically, what we're going to do is we're going to get probably about 20 people inside this apartment, okay? And we are going to get fucking trashed and have a good time. I am going to read some of the poems out of Fuck You, There will be a couple other people reading poems as well. And one of those is Adam Crawford. And so I'm super fucking stoked about that because me and Adam have not met in person yet. So this is going to be a lot of fun. I'm still waiting on confirmation from the second poet. So I'm crossing my fingers, really hoping that she will want to read. There's that. So my question to you is, if you would like to be... At this thing, if you are going to be in the Los Angeles area on December 2nd, let me know and I will invitation you. Okay? There's that. So that's kind of new. I've never done a launch party for a book before that's not virtual. Um, I might film some of it to show you guys the debauchery, but um, I don't know. Like... This was brought up to me, like, as something I should do to start inserting myself into the community. I'm like, okay, cool, I'll just have a party and say it's a launch party, and then there'll just be a bunch of motherfuckers getting fucked up. That's cool. And I was talking to a friend of mine, and she's like, no, you have to, like, read. Like, it's a launch party. You have to, like, read your poems. And I'm like, like, I don't have a problem reading, but, like, I was just like, oh, like, I just thought we were going to get trashed. Like, what the fuck, right? I don't know. We're trying it. And if it goes well, then I'll do another one. And if it gets to the point where it's bigger than could fit in my humble abode, I'll start, like, renting out bars or whatever. Because that's what you do, right? So, fuck you on Monday. And hopefully there will be a couple more of my ebooks up on Monday, too. Yeah, maybe I'll put up, like, two or three. Who fucking knows? So now, on with the Shlomo. Ethan commented, because in the episode 100, I'm like, I think I answered Ethan's question. Let me know if I didn't. He said, the only part of my question I was curious about that you didn't necessarily speak to is, as an L.A. resident and artist, how do you sense the city has changed for those with boots on the ground? both living in the city and how the non-music, non-film art scene like poetry have changed to as a result. 
In saying how has it changed, this is implying that at one point things were a certain way. So let's hit that before we really dig into anything else. Okay. I'm going to have to do some like historical shit for you here. I think the poetry scene, because I know I talked about music and film in the episode 100, but I don't think I really got into poetry. So the poetry scene, I think in LA was basically the same from probably the late sixties up until the mid to late nineties. And then a lot of things started changing. But to explain what those things are, there are a lot of factors I need to hit to get us to where that was. Okay. So one of the things that Reagan did was he closed the madhouses. Okay. And what that did was put a lot of people who would normally be under care out onto the streets, which turned LA's homelessness problem like overnight into a staggering fucking mess. Okay. Now it was always bad. It wasn't that bad. All right. I mean, I don't want to say it wasn't that bad. It wasn't as bad as it is now. So basically, like, L.A. Had, has Skid Row, okay? Which is where a lot of the homeless people end up, okay? But if you've seen, like, my vlogs where I'm driving around downtown and shit like that, Skid Row could be fucking anywhere, okay? Like, there are homeless camps everywhere. Um, down by the Union Mission... Like, that place is, like, totally fucking, like, ridiculous. Even, like, up on, like, 3rd and Whitmer in that area, 3rd and Union, it's all, like, crazy. MacArthur Park, it's all crazy. Down the street from my house, it's all crazy. It's basically skid row everywhere, okay? That is a little different than it used to be, okay? Okay? So again, we're talking like, what, 40 years ago. It wasn't like this. And it's just been getting worse. Now, Mayor Karen Bass has been actually doing kind of a lot, getting people off the streets and into housing. And um, I can't remember the actual number, but it was like in the thousands that she's got off the streets. But if you were to go out there, you wouldn't be able to tell a difference at all. It's shocking. What this has done, it has took people who used to live in certain areas and kind of forced them out to move to better neighborhoods, let's say. And because like everyone was leaving areas, the rents in certain places were cheaper for people to move into. So you ended up having like a lot of like low class to middle class, working class people moving into these places. And a lot of these places would have multiple people living in them trying to like, you know, make the nut, you know. And so a lot of places that like 30 or 40 years ago were like full of artists and like fun fuckers and just like free spirit people are now just like low income workers areas. The funny thing about this is what I've seen over the last um, like maybe 10 years is that a lot of these same areas are now being flooded with especially people from out of state, like actors and artists and musicians and writers and shit who are moving to LA so they could make it in the scene, you know? They don't know where the fuck to move to. Like, they might, like, watch some videos and find out or something, but they'll usually go to the cheapest place they could find. And so what you'll have are, like, a lot of, like, Hispanic day laborers walking up the street 
next to like some really like scenester hipster fuckers because they're living in the same building. The problem is, is that the scenester hipster fuckers don't hang out in the area they live because it's like low class. So they like to go to different neighborhoods that are a little more upscale to try to schmooze with people because that's what you have to do if you want to fucking do anything. No matter what art you're in, okay? Funny part about this is, is that a lot of startup galleries and um, places like that will end up getting spaces in these lower income areas because it's cheaper. And so um, a lot of the places that like pop up in better neighborhoods don't last that long because the rents are too high. But if they come up down here, they tend to do a little bit better for a little bit longer. But it's kind of like pulling teeth to get people to come to this part of town. If you know what I'm saying. Like there's a couple art galleries um, like on Beverly and um, 3rd I think even Temple has an art gallery that looks pretty cool. I've never been to, but it just it looks okay from the outside. So what all of this means is, and I'm sure most metropolitan areas have the same problem. You have the people not wanting to be here, but the places that could afford to do the stuff have to be here. So it's like this push and pull thing. Now through all of this and when i said like everything changed like probably in the mid to late 90s the thing that changed there was slam poetry slam poetry i don't know exactly when that started but that would be the thing that um to me really changed the poetry landscape here and just like with every fucking thing there is dude whether it's slam poetry or insta poetry the second a new fucking thing happens all of the people who were a part of the last thing that happened are like i don't like that that's that's dumb no uh-uh like i'm not interested in that so your divisions start coming now i'm not saying this is how it is everywhere but this is what I'm saying. The other thing that happened was you had all of the poets from the leftover generation who were still here doing stuff, still doing, you know, their page poetry and shit like that. Okay. A lot of these people were people who were anti establishment and against the system and, you know, like whatever. And then throughout the 80s and 90s, they were like, oh shit, like, I'm going to have to get a fucking job. Like, I can't keep, like, playing poet. Like, fuck, what am I going to do? So a lot of these people who were so fucking anti-everything ended up going to school and getting MFAs so they could start fucking teaching at fucking universities and shit. And then the thing that they... Are you fucking joking me? Jesus fucking Christ. Oh, that's so fucking annoying. It's more annoying because I can't see where it's coming from. So you had these people who were so against gatekeeping and all this shit immediately becoming gatekeepers because like every MFA student will tell you or MFA graduate, the MFA program teaches you a fucking hierarchy. Okay, what the fuck? Helicopters, some guy drilling. Okay, so you have all that shit. And those people have their own places where they do readings, okay? And like that's more like parts of around here in downtown and in like Venice and shit like that, like more by the beach. And then you have your slam poetry stuff that's, like, more towards the university, like, UFC, yeah, UFC, USC, and, like, I guess more out towards, uh, 
not really the Hollywood area, but in, in that general direction. Um, and I'm sure there's some shit downtown for some slam shit. I haven't seen any, but I'm assuming there is. And then you have this other poetry thing. And it probably fits in with the old, the older generation MFA people. But you have this like younger generation of um, poets a lot of them are also mfas but they are they lean more on this is awful to say and i don't even want to say it but like they make it like this when they talk about it so i'm it's not like i'm calling anybody out for something it's like kind of based on lgbtqia pretty much women of color stuff like that and that goes all through Hollywood, East Hollywood, um, up through Silver Lake, and um, up towards, like, past Echo, like, through Echo Park, and up almost into, like, Pasadena. And those are, like, the different scenes poetry. The other thing that you have, and it's probably, honestly not any different than it ever fucking was. But you also have other little poetry pockets of actors who go to open mics to basically do monologues and do performance more than just like reading poetry. That's, you know, it's fine. I don't like it. It's not my thing. But um, that seems to be another big kind of thing out here because there's this other thing, and I don't know if it's like just a trend and it's going to go away or if this is like a big fucking thing in the area. But you basically have, and I can't remember exactly what it's called. It's either called visual poetry or cinematic poetry or something like that where the poet is like reciting the poem on camera but instead of just reciting the poem they're acting it out so if let's say it's like this i'm gonna be this is my poem sitting at the table loud assholes outside being assholes making me want to come over here like it's like a full fucking thing and it, it's just it's it's just not something i've ever been into but i get it we're in fucking la there's tons of fucking filmmakers out here there's tons of fucking actors out here. Most actors out here feel like they can't get any work unless they write their own script that's like a banging script because everybody out here thinks that they're the best at writing and all this other fucking shit. So whatever. So the the cinematic poetry, I think, is probably the new thing that has changed the most. But I also think how fractured L.A. is now because of income demographics and people moving in and out. Um, some neighborhoods going from they used to be okay neighborhoods, now they're not okay neighborhoods. I think that has like pushed all of the artists out to the edges. And each area has like a completely different kind of poetry. Um, as far as like the art scene goes, like the art scene's the art scene. And the thing that I have noticed is I feel like there's, like, people who go to art shows, especially if they're, like, wealthy fucking people, they kind of get off on, hey, we're going to go to a bad part of town to see fine art, you know? We're going we're gonna to go slum it and find, like, diamonds in the rough. I think that's how that whole thing feels to a lot of them. Because most galleries, not not most, a lot of galleries are in really shitty fucking neighborhoods out here. But then you could go to like West Hollywood and there's just like gallery after gallery after gallery. And it's like beautiful and everyone's f like perfect, whatever. It might have been Kerouac. Or no, it was Warhol. It was an Andy Warhol documentary, I think. Who fucking cares? Or it could have been Jackson Pollock for all I know. They were like, you know, he couldn't just go into the center 
and say, hey, everybody, look at me. Like, like what I'm doing. What he did was go to the far side of the room and let the people come to you and you be the new center. So I totally botched that whole fucking thing because I was pissed off about noise. But that whole idea kind of solidified a lot about what I feel like I'm doing like with like doing this like launch party and trying to build more stuff like I'm trying to find um a bar out here that will let me either have like a monthly night like every couple weeks do something like a um a fucked up poetry night or something like that so that is basically how I think LA has become cuz again before that the mid 90s i think pretty much all poetry was page poetry and the only difference really you had was um formalists and like free verse and even there i don't think there was that big of a difference but there was probably a difference between mfa poets and uneducated poets that was probably the biggest divide ah that's that so hopefully that answers your question let's go back in here now and look at actual comments so this is a comment from ethan actually on the poetry and capitalism with jeff taylor episode he says sponsorship is the best way to fund great art for sure Capitalism, unfortunately, drives everything toward a baseline mediocrity. Sponsorship is similar to curation. I posted a video of me sick in bed on Thanksgiving. <laughs> um, just talking about things I'm thankful for and stuff. <clears throat> and um, I got uh, quite a lot of really nice comments on here. So yeah, so... Uh, Brian, Jessica, Deb, Ethan, uh, Julie, uh, David, um, thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. This is from a Semic writer, um, and this is on the episode 103 with Jeff. Um, great interview, gents. I enjoyed listening to it. I hope in the future radical poetry has a resurgence and young people discover it more. I've been self-publishing my own books, and it's so much more satisfying than playing video games. I'm a fan of the beats, but I think a new American literary movement needs to be created for the 21st century. Since the audience for Radical Poetics is small, it makes for a good time to experiment. If nobody is watching slash reading, now is a good time to escape the screens and re-engage re with the offline world. Yeah, totally. I agree. Let's make it happen. Okay, let me see what this one says. Friends in Holy Spaces said, What about just, like, not riding the wave of inspiration? As someone with manic tendencies, there are countless ideas I've had, or decisions I've made, or texts I've sent, or things I've impulse bought online, that in hindsight were not good ideas. I feel like if I were to pour all of my manic energy into finishing a thing as soon as I get the idea, I just end up burnt out, depressed afterwards. When you act on impulse, you don't give yourself enough time to actually think things through. See also regrettable text messages. And personally, what I value most in books, film, and other forms of art is the careful consideration of detail and the deeper ideas the work is trying to convey. Now, this was about um, me talking about, um, like, striking when the iron's hot with your, ins like, when you are inspired, you need to create kind of thing. Now, I will say a couple things here. Um, as someone with manic tendencies, I hear you. But comparing an inspiration for art and impulse buying and sending regrettable text messages that's not art like you sending someone a text message because you're mad in the moment 
that's not artistic inspiration. That's you flying off the handle and sending a text message. You buying a bunch of crap you don't need on Amazon at four in the morning because for whatever reason, that is not artistic inspiration. So I think what you would need to do is understand that there is a difference between flying off the handle and striking when the iron's hot. Because, like, again, your text messages are not art. Um, Decisions you have made are not art. Impulse things you buy is not art. Okay? It's a completely fucking different thing. So you need to be able to tell the difference there. So just because, like, for instance, like, I don't know if this is going to work as an analogy, um, but because I don't know how to fucking cook fucking baked Alaska or whatever the fuck it is, doesn't mean I'm going to be afraid to microwave a Hot Pocket. Okay? Those are two completely different things. And actually, that's probably closer than what you have given me as an example of to art. Like, at least those things are both food. Your decisions, your texts, and your impulse buys aren't anywhere near. I mean, I guess a text message is almost writing, you know. But if you're sending texts that are regrettable, I'm going to assume that you sent those because something was sent to you first. And so that was a response and you fucking flew off the handle again, not art. But, um, if you want to, I don't know, like pigeonhole yourself that way and go, Oh, well, because I can't be trusted around sharp objects, you know, I guess I shouldn't write quickly or something. I don't, I don't know that that doesn't have anything to do with the other. Jessica says, everything I do is close to the cuff. Once it's out there and done, I wipe my hands of it and move on to the next thing. You'd really have to ask me what I'm working on to know if I'm working on anything. Reasons I work this way. One, social anxiety and the feeling of people watching me work. Two, not wanting people to talk me out of it. Three, having a book baby is best visited once it's born. There's too much book advice to get wrapped up in and second guess yourself. Four, I change directions a lot. I can't release a title or a book cover teaser because chances are it's going to look different once it's published. There's nothing worse than telling someone about something that you're halfway done working on and then them calling it uninteresting, basic, or not understanding the vision at all. Honestly, Jessica, I think you have surrounded yourself with shitty fucking people. Like, I don't know why anyone would say something you're doing is uninteresting or basic. Um, changing directions happens. Um, like, I've changed titles of books. I've changed book covers. I've even changed titles and covers after the book already came out. There is a ton of book advice out there to get wrapped up in and you have to just know like you have to finish the project like if you need to like take breaks from listening to stuff like me um while you're working on something do that just get the thing out and then like go back and listen to all the advice you want and like i don't know why people would be talking you out of anything Like, I just, I feel like you need to just surround yourself with better people. Like, these people sound like fucking assholes, dude. Oh, and I love you too. Welcome to the void. Thank you for saying that. Let's see here. This was a, this is from David. This is a great pep talk. I don't need it because I'm practically retired. But everything you said was so true. I, like you, have completed no small number of projects. And I have an overplus size of failures too. The world doesn't support you with everything, but heeding the muse only makes sense. I used to not talk about whatever I was working on and then would refuse to write the title even if I knew it until I was finished. But even that fell away toward the end. Oh, that's interesting. I've never done that before. 
would refuse to write the title down until it was finished. Huh. I, I see a bit of logic in that, but um, yeah. Thank you for that, though. Um, Evan says, I really love the idea of recording the process and releasing it once you're ready to share the final project. My only adjustment I would personally make is releasing them a bit quicker, back to back. Keep that momentum with the audience. I always hate when I see something cool and it's half the content with a stay tuned for part two and it's like weeks later. Plus, I'm impatient, too, and would want to keep the interaction going as consistently as I can. Yeah, so with that, because what the question or what we were talking about here was if you're going to be doing social media stuff, it would be a good idea to record or document the process of you creating something, okay? Like... Record yourself typing, record yourself like working on the cover, whatever research you have to do, like just like little snippets of shit, okay? And then either make a whole fucking video to put out either right when the book comes out or the day before the book comes out or something like that. Or if you're going to do it like Evan's talking about with doing like little chunks of stuff, like totally do that. Like I would say... If you have enough content to put something out like every day or every other day for like two weeks before the release, do that. But yeah, don't spread it out. The whole reason why I say record all that stuff and then hang on to it is because if it takes you months to finish something and you post something and then it's like three weeks later before the next thing comes out, a lot of people might not have ever seen the first thing and they don't know what the fuck you're talking about. So that makes sense. And then Brian said, so here's my deal. When I was growing up, the adults in my life ingrained two things in me that still that I still fight against. Don't brag. Somebody else. Oh, wait. Number one, don't brag. Number two, somebody else is doing it or can do it better. As a result, I find it difficult to share my creative projects with people for fear of more talented people calling me out. And if do accomplish something, don't talk about it very much because it's obnoxious. So this is something that I feel like comes from like people who lived during the Great Depression. There was like this whole thing where a lot of people got humbled really fucking fast. Because, like, my grandparents were the same way. Where it was like, don't brag, someone else is doing it or can do it better. Like, what my stepdad said to me was, because I was getting into a lot of fights and getting sent home and shit like that. He's like, no matter where you go, if you have to go to a new school again or wherever you're going, if you're at work, if you're out with your friends, no matter where you go, there's always going to be someone bigger and badder than you. So just know that. Like, there will always be someone there to kick your ass. And that is the same kind of fucking bullshit. Like, don't brag, because that's obnoxious. Um, You shouldn't fucking try to do anything, because there's probably somebody else out there doing it better than you. Eh, someone's going to be able to beat the shit out of you, so don't even fucking bother puffing up. That whole fucking mindset, that's bullshit, dude. But again, I understand where that comes from. Because, like, my grandparents, they weren't together yet, obviously, but they were kids or like teens during the Great Depression. And they saw very strong and powerful people become humbled like that. That whole like, I don't want to say camaraderie, but like suddenly a lot of people were on the exact same level. And everyone was fucking going through it, you know. But I find that that kind of advice comes from that era so yeah so um i I just think that's bullshit so you're welcome for the therapy (laughs) uh shit dude oh and hey jess what's up i haven't seen you in a while and this is from david said you're very perceptive i was at dinner with some 
I was at, I was just at dinner with some friends and one, dude, it's like laughable, but like, I'm seriously, like I've been looking around trying to see like, is there anything I can throw out the window that I think I could get all the way down to the next building? And it's like, I know the motherfucker's just doing his job and thank fuck he didn't start at nine o'clock, you know? But that is a horrible fucking noise, dude. Horrible fucking noise. You are very perceptive. I was just at dinner with some friends, and one party at the table said, people who are smarter have fewer friends. One of those, it's been proven things. I don't know how this reflects on our group, but what you're saying fits with that. You shouldn't be hanging out with shitty people. Agreed. Well, my partner and I mostly hang around with cats, and they can be shitty sometimes, too. Um, I guess an animal being an asshole doesn't bring the lingering effects of language, though. Oh, that's fucking true, dude. I hear ya. Oh, yeah, because I did a live stream the other day where um, I was fucking horribly hungover. Um, I drank way more than I had drank in in fucking years and years and years. I was just like, oh, this is why people quit drinking. This is horrible. I feel like shit. Blacking out sucks. Like, yes, I understand this now. I'm just going to go back to drinking how I normally drink, which is a light buzz, and then I fall asleep. So, um, I'm going to keep that going and the drinking to get totally fucking drunk. Um, I'm done with that. Like that, I didn't even realize that, um, that's something that somebody could do. Like it has been so long since I've gotten that fucked up. Yeah. So thanks for that. So I, um, I guess let's get into the butt plugs now. Oh, butt plugs. The new blood rag will be out next week. Bloodshed Review Issue 4 will be out in December. Um, everything got kind of pushed back when I got sick because I didn't fucking do anything. Fuck You, my new chapbook, will be out on Monday, Cyber Monday. And um, if you want to come, if you're going to be in the L.A. area and you want to come to the Fuck You launch party at my apartment with me and Adam Crawford reading and maybe one other poet, hit me up. The sooner the better, because I'm only going to let 20 people in, and that's it. I don't think I could have more than 20 people in here. There's only one more copy of Abnormal Brain, so if you want it, go to my Etsy shop, pick it up. Link will be down below. I haven't... I'm way behind on shipments. So there's a bunch of stuff I have to ship out. So if you haven't gotten anything from me that you ordered yet, I know. And I'm, I'm getting it to you, okay? So um, right now I'm just waiting for the the money maker to heal and um then i'll we'll be shipping the shit out i guess that's it like join the anarchy crew um if you join on the smallest tier you could be in like the bukowski book club and do all that other shit if you join the anarchy crew we get weekly workshops um and if you join chat book of the month you get those, you get all that shit, plus whatever chat books and blood rags and bloodshed reviews and shit like that that I put out that month as well. Um, I think that's it, right? Yeah. Yeah, so just keep buying my books, everybody. Type hard. Questions, I hate um, mattwallgmail.com. Forgot what my name was for a minute there. And I will talk to you all later. I just want to give a quick thanks to those people who make these videos possible. Anarchy Crew and my followers on Patreon. I appreciate the hell out of you guys. Thank you so much for keeping me going to keep this content possible. You guys are awesome. And if you'd like to join the crew of the Anarchy Crew, just hit the join button beneath this video. And if you'd like to become a member of my Patreon, you can run over to the link down below to do that as well. Thank you.